My name is Evelyn Ruby Grona Weinheimer. So the Grona was not one of the early families in Fredericksburg. He didn't come till 1857. But then when I go back to my father's maternal side of the family and my mother's maternal and paternal, they all came from Germany. In fact, they were all part of those first immigrants that left Germany, say about 1845, as part of the German Immigration Company to bring these immigrants to Texas and landed. Most of them were on the coast by February the 19th of 1846, which is a requisite for Daughters of the Republic of Texas. Going back from my mother's side of the family, there were the Mellring, the Schuch, the Arntz, Miller. Uh, the Millers didn't come straight to Fredericksburg. They went to Round Top first and then decided, my great-grandfather Miller decided to go to Castell, which was really the area where the, these Fredericksburg immigrants were supposed to eventually end up on the Llano and Colorado River but he wasn't part of that group and he always in fact i still have mom still has relatives that live on the home place in castell um okay and then on my dad's side his grandmother was a leindecker so my great 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 grandfather leindecker johann leindecker was with the first group and he was the first school teacher at the Vereinskirche. He had been a professor in um, Germany. However, some of the descendants now say, well, professor, that may have been a little bit different than it was today. He taught in a Catholic school, a parochial school over there. And when he, they got here, he was the first teacher. When they completed the Reinskirche, he taught for 11 months and then realized he wasn't gonna be able to take care of his family with the money he was getting, so he quit and was replaced by Brodbeck and then Ox and numerous other teachers. He um, was just like all the other immigrants. They were given a town lot the first year, and then the second year they got a 10 acre out lot. So I have researched and found through Elise Cohort's books that he had some lots on Main Street one of them being where Security State Bank is today, and the other one is further down East Main across from the Nimitz, and then um, also had a town lot on San Antonio Street, but eventually moved out to what we today call Hayden Ranch Road, out 290 West is where his outlots were. Two of his boys were already um, 18 and 20 years old. My great-great-grandfather was the 18-year-old, so they got uh, town lots and outlots also. Um, well, no, they actually were supposed to get the 320 acres for a family and the boys got the 160 acres in the Fisher Miller land grant, which is where in the area of Concho County and San Angelo and Menard up in that area today, San Saba, all those areas. So what happened to that? I, as far as I can find in the research, they eventually were told when the Adelsverein went totally broke, you can go up there and lay claim. And he went up there and sold his, and in most cases for $64, which means uh, about a dollar an acre today. Okay, the Adelsverein was put together by the king in Germany, I think, well, I don't think, I read this in a book that, and I was told by a researcher that Germany was really thinking with this Republic of Texas, they could build a little German colony over here. So a group of 21 to 22 barons, princes, counts, uh, sat down and created this German immigration company to bring these settlers to Texas. There were a few mistakes made, one, they, did send two men over here to survey the land grant, which is in that San Saba area. Uh, one of them 
advised against coming. The other one said, yes, bring them. And they listened to the one that said, bring them. They sent Prince Soames over to uh, be the manager for New Braunfels. So that was 1845. Then he went back after he felt like he had done his due diligence. Uh, he was followed by John O. Moisebach, who was our founder in 1846. The man with the red hair. The man with the red hair and also the man with the knowledge of how to handle money. And uh, he was just a general manager. I've read that Soames was more of a, he, he was not a manager and he didn't listen to a good advice. Maybe the but heat got to him Maybe too. so, uh, but there was also another reason. There was a young woman, uh, that's why there's a Sophienberg Museum in New Braunfels. Her name was Sophia and she said, I'm not coming over there. That's a wilderness, I'm not coming. So that's another reason he went back to Germany. Uh, but Moisbach did a good job and he tried to keep this company together but being that they hadn't really done good surveys, they had no idea how many people were going to take this advantage to get land, which they couldn't always have in Germany. Many of them would have been indentured. Uh, with the Industrial Revolution earlier, there weren't as many jobs available, so this really sounded good to them. Let's explain that. You couldn't get land unless you were titled, I guess, or you had some lineage that... Uh, that, you... if your father had land, the oldest boy would get the land. And the other boys, so, and this is true in my husband's family, his ancestor, Jacob Weinheimer, um, came over, whereas some of the others stayed in Germany. Uh, I know I'm kind of bouncing back, but I have visited with the group that stayed in Germany. Um, <coughs> And so and. this was a great opportunity for either people who had no linkage to, to land mm -hmm. or for the, uh, the people outside the golden one, the oldest, who mm -hmm. inherited the land. Mm -hmm. And like Leindecker, he felt like it was an opportunity because <coughs> he had that same issue in Germany where he wasn't making enough money as a teacher to maintain his family. So he thought this was a great golden opportunity also. There were fortunate ones and unfortunate ones in Germany. Mm -hmm. well, explain that. Right. Um, I do think that, yes, the fortunate ones were probably some who had education, like medical degrees. Dr. Wilhelm Keidel, who came to Fredericksburg, had an education. Um, this Leindecker had some type of education um, and a few others. Then there were also another doctor who came who had been a medic in the Prussian army. Uh, we had some furniture makers, but many of them were what you would say butchers and farmers and they really were hoping. I have read the, the handbook that was written in 1846 that told those kinds of people they could come over here and maybe find jobs, but not to think of starting new businesses. The Republic was not ready yet for that. Um, and they, they had a whole uh, description of the kinds of jobs that were available. And wheelwrights, uh, blacksmiths, were very strongly encouraged to come. So I think that's why we, when we looked down our lists of immigrants, that's what their occupation was back in Germany, either farmer or wheelwright or uh, furniture maker. So the doctor kept your body going and the wheelwright kept uh, the, the wagon going. Right, right, yes, exactly. Um, then there were some, when I looked to the another line, and I might wanna, in a minute, I want to just talk about my education sure. as growing up here, but... You're really describing your relatives. Uh, our relatives that came uh, yeah. with that mm -hmm. first group. And I really didn't pay any attention to this when I was a kid. I Yes, we went to a Leindecker reunion, but never knew that he was the first teacher until one day later when I came back to Fredericksburg and was teaching school and a... Um, young man my age was running for school board and he said I'm a direct descendant of the first teacher and I was like okay I'm your relative so I guess I am too and then since I've been uh, 
part-timing and, and volunteering through the Historical Society, I've learned more and more about that, that story. Also, since I've done my research, my mother died when she was 59, and shortly before she died, she wanted me to do, help her with some things, and she's the one that got me going, so now I've researched all of them. I've been to Germany three times, have been to some of the places where they left from, even uh, was on a mock-up of the ship that many of them left uh, in Bremerhaven. And some of them did leave from Antwerp, Belgium, and I've not been there, but I have been to Bremerhaven. It's interesting that you should ask me because I became very emotional when I was down there in the hold of that ship, which is basically the size of this little recording area we have. And I said, so this was one family's uh, quarters? And the man said, oh no, there were several families here. There were bunks on either side and a narrow pathway down the middle. Mm -hmm. And they even had all of the sounds that go along with being on a ship for that length of time. People not well, some people didn't make it. They died and were bur buried at sea. And then once they landed at the coast, they were supposed to have had transportation through the Adelsverein, which didn't happen. Uh, once they got to Fredericksburg, they were supposed to be having homes built, which didn't happen. So I just, it just became very emotional to me to think, wow, and they couldn't go back. They were stuck once they had made that decision to come and they didn't give up and look what we have today in Fredericksburg. We have various stories. I mentioned the mail ring. I do know that his wife died on the coast and he came, back, came up here with only his children. Um, and that's like several generations back because Carl, my great-great-grandfather, I guess, was um, the son of that family. We have a docent that I work with here who tells a story. There were several men who came and all that was left of that family was one young girl. And she was taken in by some other relatives, distant relatives, and brought here to Fredericksburg to lay claim to her possessions. And she, when she went to San Saba, or when they went with her there to lay claim later when the Adelsverein was no longer in the picture, they say she traded her land for a saddle. So it, it's, there's so many good stories and heartbreaking stories when you go back in looking at these families. Now, I mentioned earlier that I really didn't pay a lot of attention. Just recently, it was brought to my attention that my great-grandmother Meyer, from my dad's side, his uh, maternal side, was a, um, her maiden name was Ux, Suzanne Ux, O-C-H-S. Uh, there's a new distillery coming to Fredericksburg. Um, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind me telling his story. Stuart Skloss contacted me re recently through his public relations people, wanting to have some photos of the saloon that this Ux had in the originals where Security State Bank is today that started off as Buckhorn Saloon. And then in the late 1800s, it became the Plaza Hotel. And in 1941, the station, excuse me, the Staling family, uh, Arthur Staling bought it to become Security State Bank. But back to the saloon, they believe that this Ux had a recipe for the whiskey that they are trying to uh, reincarnate, I guess. Uh, I've never seen the recipe, I didn't know, but when he told me that, and I went, okay, so I've got Ux in my family, and I went back and looked, and I actually found the relationship. It's very distant, but it is part of my family. So those are my connections to the early immigrants that came. I was born here in Fredericksburg in 1944. In fact, my dad was not here. I have the telegram 
that was sent to him in New Guinea saying, mother and daughter, baby girl, mother and daughter doing fine. So I didn't meet him till I was 16 months old. So I realized that I was always very shy and quiet and being the oldest grandchild on both sides of the family, both the grown-up family, and my mother's maiden name was Miller, um, I was probably had a very protected childhood by grandparents and my mother. I lived, in fact, she grew up in Cherry Spring, but then when she got married, they got married on April the 24th, and by April the 30th, they were on their way to California on the train because Daddy was in the military. He had come home on his military leave. That's shortly before, well, when he got here is basically when he proposed to the parents that they were getting married. And so it was a very quick, but remember, this is World War II. So things were different back then. Although a lot of times when they were hesitant for us to go out and do things, now that I know that story after they're both gone, I'm like, why were you always so hesitant with letting us step out and do things? You left here and went to California, and then Daddy was shipped to New Guinea, and she came back here uh, in January, and I was born in August. Uh, okay, so that's 100 years after our ancestors first came to Texas, basically. My dad came home late 1945. Uh, Jobs were difficult to obtain here. A lot of men and women my parents' age went off to San Antonio and got jobs there. They both stayed here. But I realize now, at the time none of us realized it, but I realize now that because we were in Fredericksburg, we're not New Braunfels, so we're a little bit more isolated. We didn't face quite as much of the antagonism, but we were Americans. We did not hesitate when the men were drafted, like I have found photos in the archives here, early 1942, after the United States entered the war, the drafts were, and we have lists of young men who didn't hesitate, even some young women became nurses and left. Uh, our language was something we were not quite so proud of anymore, and a lot of grandparents said, we're not gonna teach these children German anymore. We don't want people to recognize us. I mean, we could easily, we didn't have skin color or anything that identified us, but our language did. Some people did have a very strong accent, which would have identified them, but for us as young children, I started school in 1950. How many things in Fredericksburg were in the German language when you started going to school? There were still church services. I do remember as a little girl going to our, the church I grew up in, the church I was baptized in, Holy Ghost Lutheran, going to church with my grandparents and sitting through a German service. And I would pick up on things. I could, I would, I knew most of the words of Vater Unser, our father. I knew some of the songs in German. My mother always, when she was at home by herself, she would sing hymns in German. Um, but we weren't so apt to speak that at school. And there were some parents who were more um, obstinate about don't speak the German than others. And you could also see there was some, uh, a little bit of pulling away from kids who came to school who still spoke German. Um, my class of 1962, which I get together with now once a month, and there are some of the boys and girls, especially those who came in from the country schools who say, I started school the first day and I knew not one word of English. And I asked them, I say, well, how did you manage? They said, all I can remember is the rest of you were very good in helping us to learn when that, if I answered something in German and the teacher said no, and, and some of them remember that ruler across their fingers, <laughs> then some of you around us would help us and tell us what the word was. Um, I have one friend who 
he was an only child and lived with grandparents and he said it was really difficult for me. I had one of my grandfathers even when I was 15, I would, being again the oldest grandchild, I helped babysit with a lot of the little cousins. And I was at their house with, my, with him and my grandmother and these cousins and we were sitting down to eat and he asked me a question and I answered him in English. And his answer was in German, was sind los? Das Deutsch nicht mehr gut genug, which translates to what's wrong, German not good enough for you anymore? That was the kind of impression they had and I thought, okay, as a 15 year old girl who's trying to fit in with everybody else, you know, all the teenage years, you're like, all right, I'll speak German to you, but when I'm in school, I'm speaking English. But I, I came to school speaking both languages and I probably Maybe it's because my parents weren't here for a while when they were in California in the service that they made sure that I would be able to speak both languages when I started school. There had been a German radio station, German newspaper, German church. Uh, what was it like in your father's era uh, when he would, uh, you know, the generation before you growing up? Uh, they spoke basically all German. Now, the one thing too, both for my mother and my father, uh, mentioning earlier that they got town lots and then they started moving to the out lots and then they started being able to purchase um, again through the land deals 160 acres uh, further and further out so my mother's family ended up in Cherry Spring my father's family uh, ended up in a place that they used to call Mecklenburg Mecklenburg which was the name of a area in Germany but late 1920s, I believe, they decided they were going to do away with that name and they call, now call it Pilot Knob. Hmm. It's west of town on 290. And um, having lost my father when he was 70, but one of my uncles lived to be 90, I'd spoken to him in recent years before he passed away, and he said, you know, we lived way out there and we were we didn't really know what was going on in town unless when we came to town. They did have a store out there. Mecklenburg had a dance hall and a store where they could purchase groceries. Now, when we graduated from high school here, those of us who thought that there was a chance we could succeed in college, that's where we went because we were going to do better than here in Fredericksburg, especially girls. So, and my parents encouraged me. I just don't know how we managed to be able, without borrowing money, to get me through college. Uh, but I did. One thing I did was to go make it in three years so that I could be graduating in three years and have a job and start making some money, which in those days was not a very big paycheck every month. It was like $4,800 a year as a teacher. Anyhow, I got a job in Austin, which isn't that far away from here. I was married and we went moved to Austin. My sister only got a bookkeeping degree and came back. My brother graduated from Texas A&M and came back within a year after his graduation. Not me. I was gone for well, the three years in college plus 12 more years before finally the, and I came, I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to come back. But finally, my husband came back. We bought a cabinet shop and my family is a construction family. My father was a contractor. My brother-in-law had an electrical business and we were supposed to have the cabinet shop. My brother worked with my dad. So, all right, we came back. So that's why I say I was the last holdout. I'm very uh, familiar with Hans Boas at the University of Texas and a young woman, uh, Blevins, Miss Blevins, who I've worked with, who has come up here and interviewed citizens. In fact, I took part in that interview. Uh, they want to capture that language evolving. In fact, I will tell you that when I have German visitors that I guide through the museum here, they will say, uh, you speak 
like they did when they left Germany. Our language here has not evolved the way it has in Germany. Or you could look at it the other way. It lives on. It lives on, yes. <laughs> it, that too. I do have a friend in Germany. She's a researcher. She was in a foreign exchange teacher with a school in Fort Worth. She would always bring the students to Fredericksburg on a day trip while, while they stayed at this uh, with the families in Fort Worth and went to school in Fort Worth. And one year, 2013, she contacted me and wanted to meet with me. And I told her I wasn't going to be here. I was coming back from my cruise on the Rhine with a friend. Uh, one of Actually, she's a high school friend and a relative, distant relative. Um, and she said, well, uh, I'm, I can stay over till the next day. So we met, I came back on the 31st of March and we met April the 1st and I, we've become good friends. She's now written a trilogy about this German movement to Texas. The first one was pretty generic, but then in her second book, after uh, purchasing a lot of history books here and researching our books and talking to me, She's written it to where it focuses more. His, it's historical fiction, but it focuses on the people in Fredericksburg. Do you know its name? Uh, the first one was Hen, uh, uh, no, Trivision der Welte on Niemer zurück, which means between the worlds and never to come back. The second one was Deep in the Heart of Texas, and then the last one was something about finally coming home and yet still not having a real connection, I think was sort of what it was. And uh, these are in German or they're English? They're both. Okay. She wrote them in German and then she had a good friend who I've also gotten to know, a teacher, retired teacher now in Texas, who translated them to English. And there too I noticed a lot of difference in the German, the way that book is written. I've read both of them in German and it's like, well, now that's an English word. Okay, that, you know, the, the sentences just don't, I can read, um, just the other day, I found a letter written in German. It was a disagreement between two people and I could read that very easily. But now when I try to read letters that are sent over here from Montabar, our sister city, I have a little bit more difficulty because again, our language has remained and theirs has moved on, so it's difficult. It's ironic, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, tell me about the sister city. What, what, uh, what is it like? Uh, it's a small village. Well, it's a pretty nice town. In fact, Barbara, this friend, Barbara Ortwine, took me there and I met uh, Guido Feich, who knows many of the people here. Um, in fact, George and Nelda Vogel and Alton and um, his wife, Alton Clear and his wife, went over there because George and George mainly and Alton were looking their relatives and they were looking for their family over there without having really researched anything and they found them in that area. And this next year, 2022, they're going to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the partnership between Fredericksburg and Montabaur. So that's that's the relationship there. We've had numerous groups from here go to Montabaur. We've had exchange students come here from Montabaur and then we've sent students over there also. But the pandemic just the past couple of years has kind of slowed all that down. Do they have their old buildings like Fredericksburg has its old buildings? Uh, yes, yes. Um, that's another thing that's impressed me when I go to Germany about our buildings here are 175 years or less. Over there, they're three and four and a thousand years old, uh, the castles especially. But yeah. we've got them at least. Yes. Urban renewal hasn't swept them away. Right, right. That's, that's I think what makes Fredericksburg unique. Yes. And I mentioned earlier that my father was in construction and when, that's what he went to when he came back from uh, World War II. He first worked for the lumber companies. Uh, the first one was, well, it's gone now, but it stood over next to where Strayer and Offers is now. Uh, he, 
it was Kahneman Lumber Company at one time, then it went to Mutual Lumber Company, and then William Cameron, and it's had different name changes, but he worked as an independent carpenter for them, and then finally, after I graduated, or about the time I graduated from high school, he formed his own partnership. And um, I sometimes think about some of the buildings that he redid, the publishing company, the Coerts had mm -hmm. on Main Street, was one of the buildings that they gutted, but they didn't tear it down. They gutted it and then redid the inside. Um, there's another one where I th the businesses have changed so much, but it used to be uh, a craft store. It used to be Wins, um, and I think now it may be Eway Furniture or something like that. Uh, that one also was gutted, and it was built by the Joseph brothers. Uh, he was not part of the destruction of the La Mesa Hotel and the Keeneman Hardware up here on Main Street. Those were that was another carpenter group that in the 1960s. Now, what changed it? Okay, I really realized that when I graduated from high school in 1962, and I wanted to. I guess I was kind of a free spirit, much to the chagrin of one of my grandmothers. I took off and went to Denton to go to school at North Texas State. Didn't get to come home except Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter. Went straight through, so I didn't have summer vacations either. But when I would introduce myself to people in Denton, especially those who were not from Texas, where are you from? Fredericksburg. Is that in Texas? Yes. Where? And so I'd explain. And then November the 20, whatever, 1963 happened. In fact, I was there when I was in Denton, 30 miles away from where Kennedy was assassinated. It's a very difficult weekend. I couldn't come home. It was the weekend before Thanksgiving. I'm sorry. And, you know, I was like, what's going to happen? Am I okay way up here? But I think when Johnson actually became president, that's what put Fredericksburg on the map, and things have changed. He would ask for the Fredericksburg press, Mr. Cowart, to come in front of Associated Press and ABC and NBC and see. Right. He he wanted a question yes. from the Fredericksburg press. Right. Uh, we even when I was in high school in 1960, when Adnar came over. We, I remember, we went out, and that was a big deal. Now, who was Adnar? Uh, Adnar was the, the first chancellor Johnson brought to Fredericksburg, and then Earhart in 1963. I was, I was home for the holidays, but I was not as, I wasn't in the band or anything like that anymore. I played in the high school band uh, all four years, and uh, I was not very athletic, like many others like Stephen Feller and uh, Garrett Von Netzer, but we even laugh about it now today. In fact, the last time we got together, somebody said something about, boy, we're sure all moving slower. And I said, yeah, I've always been the last one in the races in school. And somebody said, no, but it was up here where I said, well, maybe so. But <laughs> I was not an athletic student. I, I hated PE, <laughs> but. But the, uh the body deteriorates, exactly. Uh, so the athleticism uh, goes away. Yeah. Uh, so and maybe it's good that you have the mental powers. And you know, that's when Kennedy initiated all the sports that's initiatives, right. and we had to. I remember that first time we had to run the football field. I don't know how many the football field over on College Street. Um, that how many times we were supposed to run that, and I had PE right before lunch, and I thought I wasn't going to make it that day. <laughs> so. But I have two grandchildren who are very athletic, so I'm very pleased at, with them. When you were growing up, did you have air conditioning? No. Now, what was that like? Okay, I didn't, it was okay. We didn't know any better. We didn't know what it was like to have air conditioning. In fact, well, I do, uh, we did, a lot of times we would go to San Antonio to go buy school clothes. Okay. And you'd go in and out of Crest and Woolworth and Joskies and those stores right and down on Commerce Street in San Antonio. 
and the next day I'd usually have a sore throat because of the, the quick change. But at home, we didn't mind it. I mean, we worked hard. We were out in the sun. Um, so let me explain where I grew up. Um, earlier, I mentioned that I was born while Daddy was in the war. So as soon as, well, before that, my grandparents bought a house right on the corner of College and Adams, which is right in the same block as the Fredericksburg Independent School buildings were at the time. I mean, I could leave school and walk down to Oma's house, uh, which I did a lot because then my mother would pick me up there if she was coming to town for her weekly grocery sh uh, trip to town. So that was on Adams. And then when they came back, uh, I was told that they bought a house in Hilda, which is a community up between Fredericksburg and Mason, and had it moved to Adams Street around the corner and a couple of blocks away from where Oma and Opa lived. And we lived there from 45 until 1949. And then my mother and daddy bought 140 acres and an old rock house four and a half miles north on State Highway 16. So would that be in the country at that point? Or? At that point it was in the country. It was an old peanut and cotton farm. Uh, the house had electricity. That's it. No plumbing. I'm think, you know, I tell people that now, and I think they must think I'm really old, but this was in 1949. Uh, Johnson, as a senator, had helped us get electricity out in this county back in 1935, so most homes did have electricity by 49. But by, I know by 1956, I know the commode came first. And, but I do remember in the old tank house, there was an old metal bathtub, and I do remember my dad in those first years taking a bath out there in that old tank house. How did you get the water into the tank house? Uh, we had a windmill right next to it, and of course we learned then already that to conserve wind energy, because that's how the, if the wind didn't blow, the windmill wasn't gonna pump water, and we were trying to, we had a one, cow, milk cow, we had some pigs, and for a while sometimes we had sheep, we had a few chickens, um, so, and mother always had a garden that was a nice size, I, I mean it's huge for what people have their gardens today, it was probably 20 by 30 feet, and she planted all kinds of vegetables, in you, fact. You lived off that garden? We lived out of that garden, and she got it to the point where she planted enough cucumbers that I remember we, I would help her pick cucumbers and then the next morning we would go into town on our day to the grocery store and deliver those cucumbers. I still, to this day, in fact, I've recently reconnected <coughs> with one of her customers and the little girls, when we knocked on the door, would say, Mama, the pickle lady is here. <laughs> So uh, that was some of her spending money. We also remember my brother Clayton and my sister Shirley, we had to wash the eggs and we would, I guess we kept them in the tank house because we would put them in this box that had 12 dozen, a gross of eggs that we would then bring to town to sell at Knopf and Metzger Produce. So, and that again was some money for us to survive on Daddy would do his carpenter work during the day and at night and on weekends we worked the farm. Let's talk about the Sunday <coughs> migration to town and, ex and explain the Sunday houses that we have. Okay. The Sunday houses go back to when they got their 10 acres and they would move out to those 10 acres and coming to town you didn't jump in the car on Sunday morning and race to church. Uh, you were traveling by wagons, by buggies, and they take, um, we've asked different people, it depended upon where they lived, it sure. could have been anywhere from half a day to an hour or two for them to get to church, and sometimes the weather was not good, the roads were bad, so they would come in on, they would load the wagons Saturday morning with goods that they had either grown or made to trade with these general stores of which there were many up and down. In fact, the Kamla House here on the 
Pioneer Museum grounds uh, had a general store and they would come in and uh, trade their goods for what they couldn't grow or make themselves. Where Chase Bank is today used to be Warman's Hall. Um, and then at one time, I have now, Bill Teague used to say there were 13 saloons up and down Main Street. I've found more than that. And I've also found that in some of these general stores, they became saloons at night. In fact, there's one, that house is no longer there. And it was a Weinheimer, it was a distant relative of my husband who had a general store there. And they had a place on the floor that had this hole that was covered and they could uncover that and they'd sweep all the floor dirt from the saloon night down into that floor and then cover it up again the next day for the general store. So That beautiful building on Main Street with the elephant on it was a saloon. Yes, it was. What was right. that called? I mean, White Elephant Saloon. And it is now being restored to become a saloon again. The Kylo Pharmacy is going to become a restaurant, I believe, and they have bed and breakfast, and it's right along uh, side the what used to be our Keitel Memorial Hospital, which the Keitels, Dr. Wilhelm's uh, descendants, Dr. Victor Keitel, built. And then in, uh, Fredericksburg Clinic was on the corner of Adams and San Antonio Street. That's where I was born. Uh, and that's where Dr. Feller, Dr. Lawrence Feller, who was my delivery doctor, started that and worked with Dr. Lester Kaiser. And then Dr. Stein was there for a while. And then in 1971, 50 years ago, Dr. Feller and Dr. Perry decided they weren't going to make it with the new Medicare programs as a as small country hospital, so that's when Hill Country Memorial Hospital was built. And it helped if you spoke German. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, I do even remember the doctors, they, they had to know that German. We also had a priest over here at St. Mary's, Father Schneider, and he would much to the chagrin of some Protestants. He would visit everybody, but the Germans, a lot of them loved it because he would come in and speak German with them, which maybe sometimes some of the younger pastors couldn't do, but yeah. So maybe we should uh, explain for people who might not be familiar, uh, Lutherans were, Lutheran, uh, Martin Luther was a German, I believe, is that yes, correct? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, in the group, so many people have asked me what the predominant religion was, and I say, well, it was, um, I'm beginning to think more and more it was basically about half and half. The evangelical Protestants and the Catholics. Um, and so we know that they, within a year, they had built the Vereinskirche, and then Main Street ran around I mean, went around the, both sides later. So it ended up in the middle of the street. But So if the church came first, the road came later? The road came later, yes. Uh, because people all said, why would they build it? No, the church came first. So on one weekend, the Catholics would use that for their religious services. And the other weekend, it would be the evangelical Protestants. But that didn't last very long. In fact, just yesterday, I found a letter written in German. I was able to translate enough to figure out that the Catholics weren't using the church anymore by 1850. So that's three years. They had built a little church over here where the old St. Mary's church is now. And so the evangelical Protestants were saying, writing back to Germany, to whom I don't know because well, no, the Adelsverein was still basically there, but it was not a very functioning organization. And they wanted sole ownership of the Vereinskirche. Uh, so that's basically what's happened. Holy Ghost just recently celebrated their 175th anniversary. They are the uh, final 
church to have used the Varines carry. There has been some uh, disagreements between the churches, especially Bethany Lutheran and Holy Ghost, but Holy Ghost still has the bell and Bethany Lutheran has the documents for baptisms, marriages, and death. Why does the church have multiple sides? Was that a popular architectural style? Yes, yes. It's an octagon shape, eight-sided, but since I've been to Germany, I've actually gone to the Lutheran church in Antebrick, from which Pastor Bassey came, where he preached his last sermon in Germany before he came to Texas. And they have a model of the old church and the top, top of the steeple has that eight-sided shape. The other thing uh, that we've always said is that uh, Friedrich Struberg or Schubert, the man who was the general director of the colony for Moisaba, who also portrayed himself as a medical doctor, but he wasn't really. Uh, when he came over, the Castle Germany, where he came from, they have a, some buildings and some churches there with that eight side, and it was his idea, they, they claim, to build it that way. I truly have read several times that if it hadn't been for the Native Americans, as far as planting crops and, and uh, finding the animals, t explaining to them how to shoot the animals that they were able to shoot, which of course they did very easily. They're supposedly to have shot a bear in the first night, May the 8th, 1846, for their one of their first meals, I'm not sure. That may be legend, but anyway. Uh, and Moisaba, that was one of the reasons he didn't want to take the people on out to San Saba because that was deep in the heart of Native American territory. And he didn't think that they would look upon this too kindly. So he spent a year doing research and they left, he and a group of 20 local men left late January 1847 and meandered through the countryside, met different tribes, until they got to right around San Saba to have that negotiation. But this was one band of the Comanches, the Penatuca. This was not the entire Comanche nation with whom he wrote this treaty. Sure, there are many group, different groups within yes, it. Yes. But we have the lovely statue there commemorating an important event. Right. And it was negotiated in March of 1847. The treaty was signed at the dedication of the Vereins, the first Vereinskirche in 1847 in May, and that's what we're going to commemorate at our 175th. Now what we <laughs> put quotation marks around our opening closing ceremony since we had to shut down so many things this past May in 2021. Because but, of the pandemic. Right. Mm -hmm. Twenty twenty two is going to be very special. We've invited several of the Comanche Nation to come. They're going to do hopefully um, do a ceremony again at the Varines Care as we do every Founders Day the, with their participation. So is this a, a, one of the few, if any, unbroken treaties? That's what we are teaching. Uh, it has I am a retired school teacher. I taught fourth grade Texas history. I've also worked with a lot of teachers in planning tours and uh, lessons for the Texas history, both in fourth and seventh grade. And it's now one of the Texas essential knowledge and skills that students uh, study that relationship of the Moisaba Comanche Treaty, which was never broken. Basically what that treaty said, the Germans could come and go as they pleased and the Native Americans could come and go as they pleased. But there are stories of young children being kidnapped, young children being killed, families being killed, um, horses stolen. But you've got to remember there were other tribes. As I said, 
other bands of the Comanche. There were Apaches, there were the Lipan Apache, the Kiowa were in this area, and the Delaware even were in this area. Um, in fact, the jacket that has always been said was given to the Krauskopf family, we're not sure exactly which member, was a Comanche jacket and Dr. James Kearney, who does a lot of research and translates a lot of these books that were written in German, uh, has said this is a Delaware jacket. The beading on it, he said, is Delaware, not Comanche. I find that very uh, striking. I think the Delaware roamed all the way up to the Great Lakes. Right. And there was a Delaware interpreter with Moisebach when they went to negotiate the treaty. In fact, Houston was not in favor of Moisebach going. He even sent neighbors, major neighbors, to try to stop Moisebach, but Moisebach was already gone. So neighbors went on with him. And um, I have, in my past uh, job experiences here, been program director, and I, for a couple of years I had a very wonderful Comanche woman come from Elgin, Oklahoma, and she just loved to visit with the children, and, and they would say, so why is this treaty never broken? And she'd look at the children a while, and she said, you're German, if you're German descendants, of course we have lots of visitors who aren't. She said, your German ancestors treated us like people. Uh, it was uncommon for all of Texas, because as you know, Texas seceded from the Union in the Civil War. We did have a the Doss brothers, but they're not German. Had a plantation somewhere down in the area of where 1376 and 290 intersect. There was a plantation there, um, because we have had numerous descendants now coming, trying to trace their lineage. Uh, but the German people as a whole did not believe in one person owning another. We did have cotton farms for a while from the late 1800s into the early 1920s and every picture that I have found you see the entire family the German family, children with the cotton, smaller cotton sacks on their shoulders, picking the cotton. Do you want to talk about the hanging tree? Did the, did the Germans pay a price for uh, being different? Yes, yes, uh, in many ways. Um, and which is something that is just recently, probably in 2012, when they celebrated the sesquicentennial of the Nueces massacre, more and more is beginning to come to light. We've had researchers writing about it. Um, what, hap what would happen? Okay. S the Confederate Army would come through here trying to conscript the young men. In fact, they even uh, extended the age so that more young men would have to serve in the Confederate Army. It divided some families. Some brothers would join and some wouldn't. Uh, and some of the guys would try to hide in caves when they knew that the army was coming through. Their wives would bring them food at night or, and when it, they thought it was safe. We have a story of Peter Bond who put on his wife's clothes and went outside to do his gardening or farming so they wouldn't recognize him. Uh, they did catch some of them. Some of them did spend some time in a Confederate prison. A group of them, after, especially after the governor said, if you're not going to serve in the Confederate Army, you need to leave the state. So this group decided, okay, we're going to go down through Mexico, come back up along the Mississippi River, and go join the Union Army. But as in all cases, we had some uh, people who would tell on others. We had a Captain Duff. We had a rebel by the name of Waldrip who started trying to find out. And, and people were very scared because they didn't know, was their friend still Union or was he Confederate? 
because they really had to be very careful. So this group got together, escaped, and got as far as the Nueces River. Had they not camped that night, they might have made it. And then they were massacred. Their bones are now interred at the Monument in Comfort. And the families couldn't even do that until three until one the, after the Civil War. A few of them did manage to continue on. We have the story here. The family has been uh, very helpful and worked with me in us trying to tell that story of a Jakob Kusenberger, Jacob Kusenberger, who did escape. And three years later, his wife was out in the yard working, and she heard something and turned around, and he was riding back with his sword at his side. And she had a surprise for him. Their little boy was standing at her side. He was three years old, and he managed to come back. Then the hanging tree that you mentioned, a lot of them were hung. The, uh, this Captain Duff and this Waldrip would come around and ask them to uh, swear their allegiance to the Confederacy, and their answer was, Troya der Union, true to the Union. And so they'd drag them out and hang them. Is there a tree that still is alive today? Yes, there is supposedly one. I have not been there, but uh, numerous other people know. Uh, Glen Tribes, I believe, knows exactly where it is and whose property it's on. Yeah. That's not the first time that people have been asked to swear allegiance to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, these people had just, okay, so the war started in the 1860s. They left some of that unrest in Germany, too. I didn't, you know, I mentioned land, and, but there was also a lot of other unrest in Germany at that time. And so why would they want to go into a, another war? Why would they want to leave a country that had provided a home for them? Maybe they didn't want to be in a war, and maybe right. they wanted land, and they couldn't get land. Yeah, yeah. Good motivation. Exactly. The uh, Fredericksburg wasn't always bed and breakfasts and oh, no. uh, wine tastings. No, 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 no. In fact, you could drive down the street on uh, some days of the week and it looked like ghost town. Um, and you said, I grew up without air conditioning. I grew up without television. And I just asked five of my friends, and they said, no, we never had television when we were children. Um, so we didn't know what was going on in the rest of the world. Uh, there was not a lot of politicking. Gillespie County is still considered to be a Republican county, but it's changing. But, you know. I think when LBJ was president, Gillespie County still was a Republican. Yes. Even though he was a Democrat. Yes. As president. Uh, many people have asked me about the people in Stonewall. They really, uh, you know, grew to really uh, accept him because for them, having that ranch down there, it meant income. It meant jobs for some of them too. So that was a different story there. But Fredericksburg was one single main street. We had Knopp Metzger's grocery store, Yankee and Shana Wolf, which used to be next to Dooley's. Uh, and Dooley's the was there. Dooley's Dooley. was there. Schmidt's had the IGA grocery store, kind of where Russell and Rob's is now. There was a Piggly Wiggly on the corner of uh, Main and Adams where um, T-shirts, etc. Hudson and Taylor is located now. We had the drugstore, Collenberg's drugstore. We called it the drugstore. We, it, it wasn't a pharmacy back then, uh, because it and it had a soda fountain too for a while. Central drugstore was a couple of doors down in the middle of that block. Candy counter. I bet it had one of those too. I bet it did too. Yes, and we had gas stations on every corner. And that's because even when our ancestors first came here, Fredericksburg was the last. Uh, they always said, in fact... 
Heading west, I guess. Nimitz huh? had a sign out said, last chance for a warm bath and a warm meal before you got to El Paso. So, uh, especially the stage writers. Now, girls always questioned me about that. I said, this was the stage writers. There were bathhouses up and down Main Street where they could stop and get that warm bath. Now, what's a stage writer? Stage writers would have delivered the mail um, and uh, other deliveries. Come in by stagecoach? Came in by stagecoach, yes. We do have a picture of a stagecoach stopping in front of the Nimitz. Um, and the Western Union, would they, uh, did they have an officer by any chance? Just uh, uh, you don't know? I think okay. it was, they must have had it by 1944 because how did Daddy get that telegram? But uh, Radio Post, one of our newspapers, had a uh, telegram office, as I remember, but that came after the stagecoach days, I'm pretty sure. That's an interesting name for the radio station and the newspaper. Radio yeah. Post. Radio Post. And uh, so we started off with Gillespie County News, and then that eventually evolved into Fredericksburg Standard. Uh, William Deedle worked for the Standard first, but then he started his own paper, the Radio Post. And then in 1980s, the Radio Post closed down, and the Standard is now called the Fredericksburg Standard Radio Post. The radio was king. I guess that's why you wanted to attach the name radio to your newspaper, because it made you sound important. Right. But we didn't have a radio station, I guess, until because Norbert and I, Aline Fritz, with the backing of Arthur Staling, started that in the 1940s upstairs above the Security State Bank. I bet there was German on that stage. Uh, there was, yes. And po they still have a polka party um, early from 8 to 9 in the morning for the older clientele of the radio station. I mentioned cotton earlier, and then the boll weevil came in in 1920s, and a lot of that just went bad. It just destroyed it. Destroyed the cotton farmers. Uh, and also the peanut farmers were here for a while. That was went on a little bit later. I mentioned earlier that the farm that we bought was an old cotton and peanut farm. So by 1949, they were having to start looking for other sources of income. The uh, county agent, Henry Grody, advised them to diversify. And that's when they started um, coming up with other crops. Of course, they had been planting cotton, I mean, uh, corn and oats and wheat, and also the goats. They started running because a lot of the, the land sort of north and east of town is good for the peaches and, and the farming. But then you go west of town, you're going to do better with goats and uh, grazing animals, um, and they also started raising more cattle rather than the just one milk cow. Uh, so that's when, and also the earliest peach orchards were in the 1920s into the 30s. Uh, people like Edmund Dicker and um, Otto Eckhart. The Eckharts are still in it. Dicker, Dicker is still in it and uh, Enderlin, Enderly, B.L. Enderly and Hiram Hodges. They were some of our first big peach growers. And they would uh, have pick your own. You could go out to their orchards and pick your own peaches. And then they started delivering them to the bigger grocery chains in the big cities. And they became famous. And became famous, yes, yes. We also had a winery and a nursery here back in the early days out on uh, what we call 1631 or Cave Creek Road in that area. Uh, a man by the name of Four Hour came and started this nursery and he had the Fredericksburg Winery. We still have a bottle in the Kamla, a jug in the Kamla house down in the cellar that says Fredericksburg Winery on it. Ranch. 
Morris Ranch was a horse ranch, 23,000 acres, started by Charles Morris. And they had a... 23,000 acres. That's mm -hmm. important to underline. It's almost right, right. incomprehensibly large. Yes. Uh, uh, Max Hirsch was a trainer, and he became famous for the horse that won the Kentucky Derby. Um, some, well, Billy Rader's father, young men who worked for them would get on the train to go bring horses back to the ranch. But the Morrises were an English family, and the German wasn't so acceptable there. In fact, we have found a note that was issued to the employees that they were not to speak German on the ranch that uh, is in our archives here. But uh, that ranch has just kind of been divided now. Uh, there, yesterday we spoke with a young man whose family, the Heard family, now owns part of that and he was trying to do some research on it so that's kind of fresh in my mind. I don't have all of the, but they had like a dormitory for the jockeys. They had a, a racehorse uh, grounds out there. Racetrack? Racetrack, thank you. And um, they had the Morris Ranch School, uh, was a community school, but it's no longer one of the mm -hmm. historic one-room country schools because it's been sold with the rest of the property. Post and, office, I guess. And the, yes. We have the document that uh, decreed Charles Morris as the postmaster out there in our collection. You know, in the book Centennial, they talk about how many investments were made by British people right. in the Western development of cattle land, and uh, I mm -hmm. guess that's an example of it. Right. And the goats, um, talking about them, that was a big investment too that they thought, and uh, Steeler was our goat king. Uh, Adolf Steeler started the, really brought the goat industry to the foregrounds. In fact, we have one of our, well, it's the book that was put out with the 150th anniversary of Fredericksburg, has a picture of him with a goat in a car because it was part of the mohair seat in the car. It was a, a commercial, it was a promotion, but so many people find that so interesting. That, But um, I know that some people sometimes carried a goat in the car or whatever, or baby pig or whatever, maybe. So, uh, But in the 1950s, uh, the bottom fell out of the mohair prices, and so that's also kind of, that's not, now we have a lot of meat goat uh, production here in the county. When you say goat king, how many goats do you have a, uh, any uh, I, I'm idea? I'm sorry, I can't even begin to say. But, but truly, he was one of the largest uh, goat uh, ranchers, I guess, yes. uh, in the United and a, States. And it was not just in Gillespie County, it went into Kerr County and Kendall County, yeah. Uh, his property was right on the, some of his property was right on the Artists have been famous from the beginning in Fredericksburg. Um, Herman Lundquist and um, Petrie both studied at the Academy in Dresden, the Art Academy in Dresden, and then came here to Fredericksburg. Lundquist is famous for that um, painting of Fredericksburg that looks like he's sitting out on uh, the development uh, windcrest up on that hill looking across Fredericksburg and um, Petrie did more of the animals and uh, we have in fact we're going to use some of those in our orientation plaza that is in the process of being constructed here on the grounds of an early farm and we also have a one of his called Sunday visiting where the families in a horse and buggy riding uh, to go visit on Sundays. And then Lundquist had a brother, Adolf, who was a silversmith, so we have some of his spoons that he uh, was able to make. Then uh, as we move forward, let's see, 
We had... Um, oh, G. Harvey had a studio here. G. Harvey had a studio. <clears throat> he came, oh, late 80s, early 1990s, I guess. Uh, Charles Beckendorf was the wildlife artist that married a local girl much earlier. That was, she uh, probably was a 40s graduate of FHS or somewhere in that time, and so he went. FHS being the Fredericksburg High Fredericksburg School. Fredericksburg High School, yes, uh-huh. Uh, let's see, and then G. Harvey, uh, he's deceased now, but he still has a lot of paintings out there. Wonderful Western art with uh, uh, dramatic light and right. all kinds of weather conditions, you right. can imagine. Right, right. Um, many of the other names fail me. We just had a okay. wonderful 175th art painting uh, exhibit at the Nimitz, which closed in September, but they went through a lot of the early, early uh, artists in Fredericksburg. Um, it's almost an art colony, you know, you well, cultivated that yes. sort of thing. Yes, I should even mention Felix Weinheimer was also, he has some great paintings of Main Street, both looking west and looking east uh, from, and then, the, oh, and another one was, um, oh, his name is not coming to me. It's okay, I can edit it, it's a wonderful Lentz. thing. Lentz, Lentz. Oh, say it again, so what's another one? Another one was Lentz, uh, can't think of his first name right now, but he had some good paintings of early Fredericksburg. He actually was a minister's son who grew up uh, probably in the northern states, and when I listened to his interview, he really mentioned a lot of, because his father, that was, the pastors had a lot of issues sometimes because they wanted to continue to preach sermons in German, and they were getting into trouble for that during the wars like World War I and World War II but then they moved to Texas and he eventually ended up here in Fredericksburg. Uh, Gutthold Lentz was his name. Why did Main Street stay uh, with the, the stone buildings? Why, why didn't urban renewal come in like it's happened in many other cities yeah. and uh, tear it all down and modernize? Well, and I think that before 1960, we. We, pr we did tear down. There are some things that are gone. There's a house up here where Crinwalgi Motors is at the Y that had these Victorian gables mm. that was torn down when they built that, well, Hein Chevrolet built that dealership first and then it became Crinwalgi Motors. Beautiful home, it's called the Zinke House and that's gone. There are some other buildings that are gone but the historic review board when Fredericksburg began, I guess, in the late 60s, early 1970s. We had mayors and people like Shotzi Crouch, who was Adolf Steeler's daughter, um, Tyrus Cox, who was a res well-known restoration architect, who started to look at these old buildings whenever somebody wanted to refurbish them, like the Lindenbaum, used to be the Warman's Millinery, and then it became First Federal, now, my father was part of that renovation for Tyrus, and uh, they said, we've got to keep what we have. We have to work in uh, the roof style, the window styles, the gables, whatever was there on the outside, it had to stay the way it was. And so that has become more and more, and it's brought a lot of people to town, like the Carter family, um, the Collins family. They've come to town and they've, and that's happening more and more, except now it's kind of going in with <laughs> STRs, the short-term rentals. Uh, we're losing our neighborhoods because we're, we're investing in these homes now, but we're not living in them. We're using them as short-term rentals and it's starting to, and it's, a, it's a double-edged sword. You mentioned earlier that mm -hmm. you have provided a a place of living for a band director. Our young teachers, our young nurses and doctors, our young people who are our workforce can't afford to live here. That's what's happening, so. So Fredericksburg's actually got a committee to try to find affordable housing for people yes, who we do. work here. In fact, I do know that there's a professor from Texas Tech with his students in town as we speak. 
working with the university hill country university center trying to come up with workforce housing ideas it's it's his class it's his fall class and his students are here to work on that with the city okay um, Nimitz actually came not with this group he came from the East Coast but he'd always been a seafaring man and when he came here to Fredericksburg you better explain that what do you mean not with this group okay th this group of immigrants that I uh, have mentioned earlier the 1846 immigration I think it was more into the 1850s uh, when he came but he did marry a German girl Sophie Miller and there was a building already there where the Nimitz is now but he went on and turned it into the hotel had the ship facade on it which when I was a child a young person growing up was all taken no, to make a modern three-story hotel in 1925 a group of 15 businessmen turned that into a brick three-story hotel but now it's been restored back it was supposed to be like a uh, a ship yes. nosing out onto the street right yes yes that used to be an area between buildings for the state for the horses and there was a well right there and they have found a well in the center of the floor so they have put glass over that that you can look down into the well just like the outdoor restaurant has that and there are a couple of homes two of them that I have been in that have done that the cisterns the wells have these thick glass coverings with light down there so you can look down in celebrating the well yes celebrating the well and that makes perfect sense you you stay in the hotel you have to have some place to put your horses right so right. there were stables next stables, door yes yes uh -huh. and then the, a, a famous birth happened right across the street basically yes Admiral Nimitz was born in Fredericksburg uh, his mother is a Henke and that is a Fredericksburg German name uh, who married a Nimitz and his father had died shortly before he was born so his mother after Admiral Nimitz's birth moved to Kerrville or closer to Kerrville because between here and Kerrville there's a lot of property that you if you go back to the early early landowners it's going to have Henke on it all the way into Kerrville and he actually got his appointment at uh, Tyvee High School didn't actually graduate in Kerrville yes when he came back in October of eight, uh, 1945 at the end of the war he went to Kerrville first for a big celebration there they gave him his diploma that day then they brought him to the county line the commissioners and the people from Kerrville the the high important people and then our commissioners and city people county people met him there and brought him into Fredericksburg sort for a, a parade a, like a handoff yes like a handoff and then they had parade and all kinds of festivities he um, dedicated some uh, the front in front of uh, Moise Bass Memorial at the Vereinskir that day to all of the um, men who lost their lives in World War II and then they had a big banquet for the family and distinguished guests that evening in the ballroom at the Nimitz. So again to when I was talking about when I grew up the Nimitz ballroom was used for wedding receptions and that's where we had our important receptions in high school like the National Honor Society or sometimes they had a prom there my prom wasn't at uh, the Nimitz it was at the Turner Hall which is no longer with us but that wasn't because we tore it down that's because it burned down it wasn't just a dance hall no it, it was a lot more it was a lot more it was a dance hall a bowling alley it was the place for wedding receptions uh, up front there was a uh, what they called a card game room where 
On Sundays, men would go play scat, would play pinochle or dominoes, and uh, it was a, a family place. And that's one thing. Um, of course, I don't anymore. My husband's been gone, but I le learned to dance. My father and mother loved to go dancing. Um, there were several dance halls that are no longer around, and Turner Hall being one of them. There was a Turner Hall uh, club, and they would have dances. They would have New Year's Eve dances. There was a dance hall up at uh, Spring Creek called Spring Creek Hall. Uh, Stonewall, they had Weinheimer Hall. Out 87 South was Schmidt's Dance Hall. Cherry Spring had a dance hall. And I understand that many of the country's community schools had a dance hall close by along with a cotton gin. It was a cotton gin, a dance hall, and a church in some cases. Cherry Spring didn't have a dance hall. Doss had one. It was the Rosenbushes. Um, and they had a church. Trinity, had, Trinity Lutheran at Stonewall had a church. There's also now a Catholic church in Stonewall. Um, but the dance halls have kind of disappeared except for Luckenbach, and Albert's, Albert Dance Hall is still there. Well, one thing, dancing for these Germans was kind of uh, brought with them from Germany. They had, and that was their, they worked hard during the week and then they went dancing on Saturday n nights. And That's recreation. Recreation. Singer Fest fit right in the singing festivals and the Schutzenfest, the shooting festivals fit right in with that. Um, and then as time progressed, we did have dance instructors uh, for the young girls, Mickey McDougall Krenwogi, Milton Krenwogi's wife, was a well-known dance instructor here. Um, and the Zanta Club used to do dancing, a square dancing for teenagers on Saturday evenings, early Saturday evenings, like five to seven. So my parents would take me to that before we went dancing at a dance hall. And when we were younger, we didn't go with them. Uh, they would leave us at my Oma's house that I've mentioned earlier, they're close to school. But as we got older, we'd go along and dance. And there's a funny, the boys especially, because you know, the band had to have an intermission. Okay, so the boys just love to get down, down on their haunches, you know, squat down and slide across the floor. And then they also made money by going around and collecting bottles off of the table and taking them back up to the counter if the customers hadn't taken their beer bottles or soda water bottles back to the front. So they'd make money by collect, helping clean up during the evening. Sort of a financial upside to yes. being helpful. And I don't ever remember doing this, but I remember as I was 10, 11, going with my parents, some couples would bring their children and they just lay them out on the table and let them take a nap or go to sleep on the pallet that they had created for them on a table that maybe wasn't used by, the, by other customers during the night. <laughs> Pat's Hall was already here in the late 1940s. In fact, it burned down one Christmas Eve, 1948 into 1949, because two young men got into a fight and knocked over a heater, a kerosene heater, which immediately caught fire. And some of the um, staff lost their lives. Two or three people died that night. But it was rebuilt, and then later, well, it was Sipes Hall at that time. The Sipes owned it. And then later it became Pat's Hall. So also in addition to the hall, there was this huge oak tree with a dance floor around it. And we used to love to go, in fact, some of my class, one of my class reunions, after we'd all gotten together, we all went out to Pat's Hall and danced around the tree. So uh, that was a, but it's gone. The tree has died. And now it is a school. It's Ambleside School. And the hall used to also have a ballpark. Pat's Cubs used to play Sunday baseball. Baseball was a big entertainment also. In fact, our sheriff, Hugo Klanner, went 
up north and became quite famous for his baseball playing ability. So if you were to walk to where the church is now, that was a big baseball area. It was, and that was a big uh, controversy in the 1990s uh, because I know I didn't, of course I didn't play ball. Well girls, we didn't really have a lot of softball leagues. We had one, but the boys, the little league parents uh, were especially unhappy because they wanted their kids to do what they had done and play ball there on the ballpark when Mark Plotz was renovated to become what it is today. Where the Adelsverein Halle is, that was a huge baseball area right there. I can still see the backstop sitting on that corner. Um, and then there were two used car lots there on the side where we're going to put up the Christmas pyramid, the Pyramida in November now. That used to be behind Chevrolet's parking lot. There was a gas station next to that, between, next to the firehouse, and then there was a gas station on the other side of Moise, where the real, the cedar Christmas tree is going to be, the Zetabaum, and then there was another one down on the corner. <laughs> and let's see, wonder, I guess back where the bank building, where the city parks now, that was open air. Yeah, I guess there were maybe some ball games played there too, but they were like, what are we going to do with our little leagues if you cover all of that up? But we have found other places like over at HEB, and HEB used to be our fairgrounds until 1976. Now the fairgrounds has had several locations. Started, I guess, at Fort, Fort Martin, Martin Scott. Scott when Brody Gums owned it. It was the fair. And because they could use what the training grounds, the parade grounds from the soldiers, they used that for the racetrack. And then they moved it to, we're going back to the Turner Hall now, that was where it was. And the racetrack was on, uh, down on Lano and Travis, where those houses are now. And then in late, early 1900s, late 1800s, they moved it to where HEB is built a huge grandstand, racetrack, and exhibition hall, and then in 1976 it was moved out to today's location on 16 South. But you could find some horseshoes on those properties. I bet you could. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some other things too. Growing up the way I did, my parents never took a vacation. We never went anywhere other than maybe San Antonio shopping trip or to go visit somebody. And I've had the opportunity to, uh, since I've been retired, to travel to Canada, to England, to Scotland, to Hawaii, and three trips to Germany. And I just, it has, uh, so many people are still talking about traveling, but at my age, I'm like, I'm, I'm okay. I can sit and watch these uh, programs on TV and I can say, oh, I was there. Uh, and especially when I now tell people, pe so many people are still talking about traveling, but at my age, I'm like, I'm, I'm okay. I can sit and watch these uh, programs on TV and I can say, oh, I was there. People ask me, well, why? did they call this community Fredericksburg. It was named for Prince Frederick, who was one of those 20 uh, counts, princes, and barons who organized the Adelsverein. I, my first trip to Germany was to Berlin. I had no real, I wasn't into the history yet because I hadn't been working here, but I found it very interesting that I went to Potsdam and to the different castles that Prince Frederick had and that's who, for whom Fredericksburg or Friedrichsburg is named. Now my trips to England I associate with any time they have the parades for the Queen on television because we were there the day they were practicing and we got closer than we would have if it had been the real thing. Um, they always, it was like early parts of June that's when she actually celebrate, celebrated her birthday. 
and the carriage came by, but of course she wasn't in it, but the, uh, they were all dressed in their regalia, everybody, and I got to see the castles, Buckingham, and the one that's out in the country too, so it's, those are some things that I really, I think, gosh, I had so many more opportunities than my parents ever did. There were a few I've read about now, but a lot of them didn't go back to visit any of the family that they had left behind. They had no clue. So Once they left Germany, they, they were, never I mean, went back and they didn't have an ongoing relationship with no, those people they had they left. No, they were like, look what they did to us. Why do we want to go back and pay them any homage? I mean, that was kind of the way their thoughts were. Oktoberfest was never here when we were children. Tell me about that. It happened in 1980. A group wanted to, they created the Pedernales Creative Arts Alliance. Uh, all people who had moved to Fredericksburg who created that organization. Uh, yes, we, we had, like I've said, the Singer Fests and the Schutzen Fest. Those are festivals. The we shooting had festival. The shooting fest, the singing, the singing festival. festival. We had the fair. We always had dances at the fairgrounds. Um, lots of fests. Lots of fests, lots of chances to get together and drink beer and dance, but there was never an October fest. And a lot of the early people have always said they didn't wear later hosen when they came. Well, no, when you look back at the pictures, they had on the men always wore white shirts and dark. Trousers and suspenders, yes, uh, and heavy shoes. But and the women, the the style of the dress was somewhat the way the journals are. But long skirts were usually how they managed to do their daily chores in their long skirts and their long sleeves. But my oma always sent me back in the house if I didn't have long sleeves on when I came out to work with her in the garden. So. I look at pictures and think, you were wearing a black Sunday suit in Texas heat? Yes. <laughs> and the women were wearing full dresses and, uh, and all this fabric yes. with a wood stove blazing in the kitchen Exactly. Uh, in Texas heat? Yes. Or out there in the sun building a fire in the wash pot to get ready to wash to do the laundry for the day had to have been just stifling. And the windmill was a big deal. You had yes. to go to the creek to pull up water. If you didn't have a windmill. Uh, right? Well, in the beginning, there weren't any windmills. That's right. And so, so that's, and that is one of the reasons Moisebach thought this was a perfect spot for an alternate community instead of going to the Fisher Miller Grant is that we had a creek on either side of what he could see as a town of, as he named it, Fredericksburg, eventually after New Braunfels. And what do you mean by after New Braunfels? Well, New Braunfels was founded in 1845. Fredericksburg was founded in 1846. New Braunfels has worst fest though. Yes, they do. And they have made a huge two-week celebration or whatever out of it. I wonder if they celebrated Oktoberfest. Well, it's their Oktoberfest, I, I guess. I know. <laughs> yes, it is. 